This is the Church of St. Paul in the Desert. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the last Sunday after the Epiphany, every year, we read about the transfiguration of Jesus. Whether it's in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, we always read one version or another of this lesson. We do that for a reason that might not be what you expect, because this is not the Feast of the Transfiguration, is it? Now, there are lots of clergy out in the congregation today, but I want to ask this question to non-clergy, or spouses for that matter. When is the Feast of the Transfiguration? August 6th. Great, thank you. We have a wide range of people knowing that. So 8 o'clock I had to really dig to get. <laughs> and 4 o'clock you don't even... Oh. August 6th is the Feast of the Transfiguration. When we focus on the Transfiguration as an event in Jesus' life and we, we deal with all that. But this is the last Sunday after the Epiphany. Do any of you remember a significant event that happened on the first Sunday after the Epiphany? The baptism of Jesus. And in the baptism of Jesus, what was the voice from heaven saying then? Okay, same thing, like, say it. This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Except for one piece. Here we are, the last Sunday after the Epiphany, and the baptism, they, the voice from heaven, we presume God, said that. And on this Sunday, when Jesus is transfigured on the mountain, 14 chapters later, the voice says the same thing, and at the end, in every gospel, the voice says, listen to him. Do you think there's a message in that? At the baptism, and ever since, Jesus has been calling his disciples, and they've been going about doing things. They've been watching Jesus. They've heard Jesus preach. We've just gotten through four weeks on the Sermon on the Mount, okay, where Jesus was teaching, and still, they're not getting it. You know, Jesus asks the disciples, who do people say, who do you say, people say that I am? Oh, you're this, you're that. Who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. And then Jesus talks about what being the Christ means, and Peter corrects him. And he has to, he has to kind of let Peter know that he's not got it quite yet. The disciples, after 14 chapters, after a significant time of being taught by Jesus, still aren't getting it. So I think that's why the voice is saying to them, listen to him. And I want to suggest that if all you get from the sermon on the last Sunday after the Epiphany is listen to Jesus, I think you will be ahead of most of the Christian world. Because it's not what Andrew has to say that's going to be great. It's not what anybody says. It's listening to Jesus. And if we listen, then we have a chance to follow and everything else. In a sense, we're getting ourselves ready for Lent. So on Ash Wednesday, you will hear from either Victoria or myself, you will hear things about Lent and about Lenten discipline. And the first Sunday of Lent, we'll be talking about temptation. And at some point or other, we'll probably even be talking about sin. Okay? What I want to talk to you about is listening. Because I have a feeling that in everything that we do, in everything that we would do in following Jesus, it all begins with our listening. If we can't listen to Jesus, then how do we know what to do? If we don't listen to Jesus, how will we hear when he tells us not to be afraid if we're not attending? And to be honest... What is a very typical thing is for us to be so busy about everything else 
that we're going to get to the listening when we have time. And as a result, when the time comes and there's something for us to listen to, we will have missed it because we aren't used to it. We aren't practiced at it. We don't have a habit of listening. And as a result, it goes over our head. I had an occasion in the last month um, when I was talking to my spiritual director, and I was anticipating having a confrontation with somebody. Now, I'm sure I'm probably the only person that ever has to ang agonize about having a confrontation with anybody. Music directors as, uh, aside, they have, to deal, they have to deal with clergy. And so there's always confrontation. But the, the truth is, is that I don't like confrontation. I much prefer to live without confrontation. And as a result, my strategy is to avoid it as long as humanly possible. Okay? And I was going to have lunch, and I, was, I anticipated a confrontation, and I was agonizing about it. And she said to me, she said, what if you just decided that God had something in store for you in this conversation, and that God was simply inviting you to listen and to watch for what God was going to do? I said, well, I don't like that. I'd much rather come up with a plan for dealing with a conflict that's about to... Well, what if you just wondered, hmm, God is here. God is in the midst of us. I wonder what God's going to do in this situation. And so I thought, you know, having no better option than that, I actually took her advice. And I went and I listened and I actively prayed in advance and throughout the conversation, throughout the lunch... I was praying, God, what are you doing here? What are you doing? What, what is there in this that I should be taking away from this? And pretty soon the lunch was over, and it had been a wonderful lunch, and there was a renewal of relationship and everything else, and that darn conflict didn't even come up. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, it didn't come up. And sometimes I think that we even plan on the listening, just like I did, I finally listened because I had something that was unpleasant coming ahead and listening to somebody, even though I didn't like what she said, was better than the alternative. And so sometimes we're able to listen to God, but we kind of anticipate what we're listening to is God who's answering our prayers because we're hurting, because there's brokenness because there's a problem, because there's a solution that we need. And I'm wondering, because frankly, there was going to be plenty of time for us during Lent to focus on sin, brokenness, and all these other kind of things. I wonder how our lives might be if we find ourselves enlightened by and enlivened by God when we listen, when we're facing difficult times, when we're facing challenges and hurts and broken relationships, and we find ourselves renewed as a result of listening, how much more will our lives be enhanced if we actually listen to God even when things are going well? What if we made a practice of wondering in every situation, especially in the situations that are exciting and joyful to us, of wondering, hmm, I wonder what God's doing in this. I wonder what God's saying to me in this relationship. As we're listening to the hymns, I wonder what God's saying to me through this hymn. As we look around at the windows and we rejoice at the light and the colors through the windows, I wonder what God is saying to me through this. Now, this is something that, since it's not Lent yet, it can't be a Lenten discipline. So we're talking about a pre-Lenten discipline <laughs> that I'm inviting you to join me in. What if we made a plan to actually try to take every moment and to attend to it with the wonder and with the question of, I wonder what God has in store for me right now. I wonder what Jesus is saying about this right now. 
not holding it off until I really need him because I'm up against it. You can still do that, but just not hold off. But also, when there's something I'm really rejoicing in and excited about, and I'm thrilled about, I wonder where God is even in this excitement and joy. And remind yourself about it, because two things will happen. One, I believe that we will definitely become closer to that image of Jesus that shone like lightning. Because we'll be connected more to that. And then when there are things where God really wants to get our attention, God will probably not have to ask us twice. We'll probably say, I'm used to them listening. And I know they're listening now because they're the community of people who hear my son Jesus and follow just like he did. Amen.